Um, hello. Um, I hope no one's offended by Vim, but I love it. And there's a Vim thing tomorrow at half 11, if you want to come along and talk about Vim, because it's awesome. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about dependency injection in Ruby, which apparently is quite a controversial thing, as I found out today. Um, to understand why I'm talking about this, give you a wee quick bit of background about myself. I used to be a .NET developer before I saw the light and became a Ruby developer. And one of the things I loved um, about being a .NET developer was alt.net, and the sort of thing that brought testing and all the good stuff that we take for um, advantage um, as Ruby developers. And one of those things that I loved the most was dependency injection. And I did a lot of talks on dependency injection, loved it a lot. And in fact, the first question I asked on Stack Overflow um, when I became a Ruby developer was, how do you do dependency injection in Ruby? And I was told, you don't. Which is true, you don't, normally. Because um, in, in .NET, we do dependency injection to make things testable. But everything in Ruby is testable. It's easy to test. But there's another thing you can do with um, dependency injection, which is a really cool thing. And you, don't, you can do it in Ruby, but dependency injection to me is a pattern to use. I want to go through, through a quick wee, th wee sort of monologue about how I got to where I am with this dependency injection stuff. And it starts off when I came out as a first uh, Ruby developer. I saw a lot of code like this. Now, if you imagine these are um, Rails controllers, um, I couldn't be asked putting a full Rails app together for this, sorry. So I've got in here where we do some finder method, and imagine this here is an active record finder method as well. And it would return me a class, and you call something on it, and you return it. Has everyone seen code like that? Yeah. yeah. That's not unusual. I mean, I could run that, and you'd see it working, but who cares? <laughs> um, so I kind of I didn't like that, because it has a database call in my controller. I really, really don't like database, control, database calls in my controller. I know in Ruby, technically, it's kind of all right, but I kind of don't like it. So I moved things from being database calls to sort of um, class-level methods. I'm not supposed to call them that anymore, but for the purpose of today, I will. Um, where I had a lot of self methods, a lot of class methods that would do something, the database call would be in there, it would do some work and then return back the information that I wanted. So I'd end up with something, uh, blah, 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 where's the controller gone? Is it the top? Top, yeah. So I'd end up things like this and then I'd do whatever I need to do to output that to the screen. So I had the controller basically doing what the controller is supposed to do, very little, calling something, getting some stuff back and throwing it on the page. And one of the things I came to talking with Pete, who's around somewhere over there, Pete, um, was this thing about what if we want to change that implementation? What if we want to use something different? Or in different situations, want to use something else? In Rails just now, what we'd do is go through and change every single implementation of that. And it'd take ages, and we'd run our tests, and they may or may not break, and update them all, and it'd be a pain in the bum, basically. So after a bit of talking, we went, wouldn't it be great if we had a, a sort of de 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 dependency injection back in Ruby on Rails? So I went away and, yeah, kind of created it, much to his annoyance, because he wanted to do it. Hey. Um, so the top here, we've just got um, a class, some service, some service class. I call them service classes, because that's what I'm used to from .NET. I'm, I'm sorry if, if you don't agree with that. Some class that does something again. And I created this thing at the top here called depends on. Now, in this situation, that's very simple. What I've got here is a symbol right next to there which is exactly the same as the name of the class at the top. And what that will do is essentially create a nice little, a nice little um, variable on our controller for us. And then we can call the methods all the methods we want all the way through. And that's great um, for that situation. But what if we want something that can change whenever we want it to change, um, based on maybe based on like classic ones, tax calculator. When we want a different tax calculator for a different country, and we want to call that. Well, I went ahead and put that in, put some very basic, I say basic because I've only been working on this for like three days before the conference. Um, it's very new. Um, some very basic sort of factory support on it. So what I've got here is, as well as just passing a symbol, you can pass a lambda. And that lambda, or block, or proc, or whatever, you get the owner context into it. You can then do something like that. In this case, I'm just returning a different class. So in this case here, I've got my normal class that I had originally at the top, some awesome cl um, class service. You can tell I like the word awesome. It's such a great word. Um, and I've got it through here. And originally, if I actually go back and run the one beforehand, it would be a good idea. Uh, there. So if I run that, it'll go down here. Vim is awesome, just to let you know. 
Um, when we come down here, just creating the controller and putting that out, you'll see it will run and it will put out whatever I've got on that screen. Now, in the case, the second case, I've got a wee bit of a, a switch in there that takes, that was the original class that you saw. I wanted to now change that. So I've created another awesome class that's slightly more awesome because it uses a Dirty Harry quote, which is great. Um, and all I've done is changed its implementation here. So in terms of maintainability, this is great for me because I don't have to then go through and change all those calls and all my code. I can just switch it around really quickly. Or if I want to actually change it totally based on some dependency, some, something else, I can just change it in here by doing some sort of if statement or whatever I want to do. And then if I run that, it'll say it'll give me the different implementation. Now, to me, that's what dependency injection is all about. It's not about testing, which is always how it's sold in static languages. It's about this ability to be able to change things in and out really quickly, dependent on, um, depending on what the context is in. So I've kind of started to develop this, and I kind of want to hear other people's ideas about it. That's why I'm talking here right now. Um, already talked to Pete. We've got ideas. Of, well, he's told me what to do, basically. Um, <laughs> It's put in support to make mocking and stuff really quick, quick and easier, or stubbing, sorry, quicker and easier within, um, within RSpec and test unit and make that a lot quicker. That's pretty much all I've got to say. If you want to check out the code, which quite literally is about 10 lines of code, it's very small. Um, GitHub here. If you want to email me at all or get me on Twitter or just grab me afterward and kick my ass for doing this, that's fine as well. Just tell me I'm wrong. It's great. Um, you can get me on there. And that's me. All right, I've got, I can take a couple of questions, apparently. I've got three minutes left, so I can take any questions if someone wants to harass me right now. Just a couple? Anyone? No? No? Fine, okay. <laughs> Quicker to the pub, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'll shut that down. <laughs> well? Yeah, so it seems to be the lightning talks are just in the order that people get to the podium. So if you're really determined to speak, uh, just sort of queue up over here. Um. <laughs> Radio, um, I'm going to talk about uh, Vagrant virtualization and configuration management very quickly. Uh, I'm Gareth. Uh, I work at FreeAgent. Everyone knows that. Um, I blog. Uh, I curate a email newsletter, because they're on Vogue at the moment. Um, here's a number of disparate problems from teams I've seen in the past or worked on that you may or may not be interested in. Um, you may or may not have come across, hopefully you have. Um, new employees, <laughs> getting new employees started is often difficult. Um, some developers are bad at, well, it works on my machine. Um, why is it not working on a server? Well, it works on my machine. Um, hopefully that's not you. Um, there's a big advantage to running the entire stack of any given software project locally. Um, I used to spend a lot of time on a train, and when I started a company that didn't do this, it meant I couldn't work on that train. Pretty specific, but any time you can't run it, the internet's down. Oh, no, it's not going to work. Um, you're not in the office. It's very difficult. Um, services are a good way of doing various different things. If you can't run that locally, um, you're running to uh, odd bugs. Um, that are difficult to debug, again, without all that access. Um, not, all, not all developers want to be sysadmins, and nearly, all end, uh, no, nearly always end up managing their own um, local development environment in a somewhat ad hoc and different manner to the person ne next to them, um, which leads to odd bugs, different versions of libc between two people. Not going to catch you all the time, but if it does, you're going to hit finding out what the problem was. Um, and not all developers make good sysadmins, so that's also... Um, I think there's a number of solutions, um, uh, and they all sort of come around sort of using local virtualization, um, using some of the configuration management tools like Chef and Puppet, um, but rather than it all being about the niceties of going like 1,000 servers, this is cool. Um, focusing it inwards and using it for your local development environment, um, and then maybe using it for your team's development environment to standardize things. Um, and there's a very nifty uh, Ruby tool called Vagrant that I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, quick note on virtualization. I, like, loads of people go, virtualization, oh, I, I, I used VMware Fusion a while back and it was slow. Um, 
They were probably using it for Windows, and they were probably using it so they could use IE. Um, all of those things are painful. Um, uh, throw hardware at this problem. Anyone using like a machine that doesn't have maxed out RAM, um, do that first, and then say things are slow. Um, I say I, I used to use VMware uh, Fusion. Um, I I now use VirtualBox. Um, then it got they got went to Oracle, and I'm a bit scared now. But um, there's good tools. Um, and VirtualBox runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, and there's, there's, there's an open source version, so no excuses. Um, Vagrant, VagrantHub.com is the, the sort of tool I want to talk about for most of this session. Um, uh, it's a long list, but it's a t uh, normally when you're managing VirtualBox, there's a GUI and you're clicking things. Um, and there are some config files, um, and there's some properties and some XML things, and there's a command line app that you can send very weird messages to, and it'll, it'll set things up. Um, Vagrant removes all that and gives you a very, very simple DSL that I'll show you in a second um, to manage all these bits and pieces. Um, it's for automatic, it, it supports automatic provisioning of those virtual um, box instances using Chef and Puppet. Um, they're virtual machines. They're often headless virtual machines by default, so you, you're not having to carry around a big GUI. Um, you just SSH into them. Um, you can manage the network stack of one or more virtual box machines for doing static IPs if you want to show someone else. Um, you can forward ports from your local machine if that's already on a network. Um, you can very easily share folders um, in a few ways. And you can package these boxes up um, and give it to your colleagues or put it on a server so new employees can grab it. Um, and I now find myself whenever I go, oh, that's a cool project I'd, I'd quite like to play around with, I just grab a new environment. I might play around with it, go, oh, that was cool, and I might then throw that away. It's like the cloud sort of experimenting with, with virtual servers. You just you get into the habit of just throwing them up and tearing them down, and it's liberating, rather than having to manage all these things. Um, it's a gem. Uh, you read people, you know what that looks like. Um, at its heart, it has a vagrant file. Um, basically, a, a text file called vagrant file, like a rake file. Um, and you have a Ruby detail, and this, and this is basically the sort of basic, the sort of minimal feature, um, would be, I want to use a box, a box is simply just a pre-built image with the Vagrant tools and an operating system on. Um, uh, and this would be saying, I've got a box locally called Lucid32 um, running Ubuntu. Um, and I can run the Vagrant tool, just say Vagrant up against that file. And it will spool up a new virtual machine um, and then allow me to search into it. Um, you can set up port forwarding. so. You might be running a Rails application there, but you want access to it from your desktop machine, from your laptop. Um, well, it's port forward. Um, send one port to another. Um, so you can export us lots of ports on your, that are on your local machine. So you just go to localhost 7000, and it's proxying it. Well, not proxying it. It's basically forwarding it through to the virtual machine. Um, and there's just a config file. And use the one-liners, and you can add them and take them away. The auto property means that it will automatically discover one that's not in use. So it, I have lots of machines, and I, I, I bring them up and down. And I, just, I want SSH access, but I probably don't care about the port, because there are other tools to manage that, SSH config for one. Um, and so it will find one that's not in use. Um, shared folders, again, shared folder configuration in VirtualBox or in VMware is pretty gnarly. You have to do a lot of work. Um, Vagrant gives you a one-liner that you can put into these config files. Um, talking about sort of service-based architectures, sometimes you want multiple machines. You can have a vagrant file. And remember, this is a text file that you can put in version control and you can share between you that can bring up multiple machines um, in one file. So vagrant up will bring up two machines, or three machines, or 10 machines before your machine runs out of RAM. Um, uh, talking about boxes, these are the sort of encapsulate the tools and the operating system. Uh, this is a website I put up that sort of is, a ho is hosting a lot of these boxes. Um, so you can find most operating systems. Um, Debian, Ubuntu, uh, uh, Red Hat, there's it's a Gen 2 one, and there's most operating systems covered now. And you can make these boxes internally if you have very specific requirements. Um, but what I prefer to do is use config management tools to provision those boxes. Um, uh, so this is what doing it in Chef looks like. Um, uh, again, you build up these files, um, and you can say, well, I, I've got a lot of uh, Chef configs. Um, and I want this machine to have the, this role um, when it comes up. Uh, 
you can spec you can tie this in with the chef server. Um, so if you've already got a chef server set up that you're using for your production stack, you can point this at it and say, oh, it should have the role of this type of machine, DB machine, a web machine, a developer workstation machine, whatever you want. Um, and you can do more complicated things. So this is one I use all, all the time to, every time I bring up a new virtual machine, I want my uh, Z shell config and my Vim, Vim configs on there. So two people at Vim. Um, and this will do that. It just drag, drags, drags, my, uh, drags the cookbook down from GitHub and puts the config files on there. So I get my shell straight away whenever I fire up and throw away these machines. It's very nice. Um, you can do the same thing with Puppet. You can, again, have local files um, in that directory uh, and say, well, run this manifest file. Or you can point at a Puppet server. So if you're already using Puppet to provision your infrastructure, you can use the exi your existing Puppet infrastructure to do the same things. Um, run through that quite quickly. But I, for me, the advantages are you can minimize finding weird bugs only in production. Um, there's lots and lots of people here with Mac laptops. Uh, how many people are using XServe in production? It's like, no one does it. There's, there are subtle differences that they don't ca catch you very often. But when they do, you've got a problem in production that you can't replicate locally. And finding those bugs are, is I'd rather do this than find, run into bugs like that. Um, case insensitive file systems. If someone's going, oh, what's that? Do, yeah, read about case insensitive file systems because the Linux and Mac are different. Um, uh, early and often testing of your configuration files. If your sysadmins do this at the end, um, it's like anything that's just done at the end, it's going to be poor. If you can run through everything all the time, it's like CI for your uh, configuration management stuff. Um, executable documentation is always better. Onboarding someone. Um, oh, here's the documentation for setting up your development environment. That's only ever up to date it's the days after that person started. <laughs> because they go through, it doesn't work. Oh, yeah, change it. doesn't work. Then a few weeks or months go by, someone else comes in. Same problem. Executable documentation that's run all the time will always be right. Um, and it leads to faster onboarding. You can just go, hey, here's a Vagrant file. Vagrant up, download box. Uh, chef, puppet, configure that machine, bang. They're up and running really quickly and they can be productive quickly. Even more important for contractors. Um, and there's a shared la language between development and operations and that's important if you have a, two teams that have a split between them. And I've finished. <laughs> that was good. No questions because that was 10 minutes. <laughs> um, um, if anyone's interested, come speak to me about it later on. I'm happy to show demos of how I use it and the tool in practice. Hello, everybody. Um, so this is something a little different. Um, this is a, a productivity enhancement tool or a technique that you can use uh, independently of the language you're using. Um, it's called Top 5. Um, we'll see how it, why it's called like that in a moment. This is 105 check. So let me tell you a story. Um, at the beginning of the last century, uh, Charles Schwab was heading the Bethlehem Steel Corporation in the US. Um, the company was not doing very well. Very well and at that, uh, at that time, Charles was uh, hiring Ivy Lee, uh, a consultant, uh, for uh, public relations. Um, Ivy Lee is known now as the, the founder of what is called modern uh, uh, marketing relationship uh, and uh, Ivy Lee uh, told Charles, um, let's try something. So I heard your story. I think I know the problem. So uh, let's try to do this. Um, uh, take this piece of paper and write down what are the five most important things you need to do tomorrow. Um, in five minutes, Charles wrote down those th five things. Uh, then Ivy said, uh, well, now prioritize them in the order that you think they are most important. Uh, another five minutes passed. Then the paper was ready, so these five things were ready. And Ivy said, okay, so first thing in the morning, 
tomorrow when you go to the office, start executing the first thing in the list. That's all. You don't need to think about anything else. Start executing. And uh, don't worry if you don't finish all the items in the list. Um, just try to finish the first one and start with the second one only when you finish the, the first one. So uh, respect the sequence of, of the things on the list. Um, in total, this explanation uh, was about 25 minutes. Uh, and what happened was that after two weeks, uh, Ivy Lee received a, a $25,000 check, uh, $1,000 for each minute that sort of consultancy uh, lasted uh, because uh, uh, those simple advices changed uh, uh, the, the future of Bethlehem Steel, uh, the Steel Corporation. And uh, at that time, it became one of the largest independent uh, steel uh, industry in the US. And uh, Charles was a millionaire for that reason. So he sent this 25,000 check back to Ivy Lee. So this is the story of uh, f where the top five name com comes from. Then in more modern time, uh, so this story has been told countless uh, time and blogs and uh, uh, books. And in more, more modern times, um, Cameron Herald uh, rebranded uh, this story or this technique to top five. Uh, a few suggestions of how you can use it now, uh, other than that you're not allowed or supposed to put more than five items on the list. This, this is very important. It's uh, what makes the technique simple and powerful at the same time. But you can use variation of it, top four, top three, depending on the kind of work you're doing. You can tweak it and try to understand what is the best thing that works for you. Um, maybe you should share this list publicly so uh, other people can see it and you can feel the the peer pressure to finish it, to finish the items on that list. And maybe you can expand this list to other time windows, uh, simple time windows like uh, uh, this week or this month or maybe this year. So let's try to see an example of uh, how you can use it top down, which is, in my opinion, the, simple, the simplest way of using it. So let's say that is this year um, I want to write my first closure application. Uh, I'd like to run a marathon, and uh, I'd like to learn Portuguese, so maybe uh, sustain a casual conversation in Portuguese with someone. Uh, what I need to do this month to achieve those goals, um, maybe let's try to run at least 10, uh, uh, con continuously at least 10 keys, uh, 10 kilometers. Um, maybe I can start attending the weekly local Portuguese meetup group where our other people are talking the, the language I want to learn. And uh, um, I can maybe this month try to arrive and try to achieve the goal of running simple closure scripts. Then what you need to do this week to achieve those goals, um, always not more than five or not more than three, um, maybe I, I should read the first two chapters of The Joy, of joy of Closure. Um, maybe uh, I should try to run at least three times this week, and uh, maybe uh, watch a couple of movies in Portuguese. And so what I need to do today, finally, um, well, I can start by installing Clojure and REPL to do some experimentation. I can try to run a 5K, and uh, maybe I can start by learning the first 10 numbers in Portuguese from 1 to 10. So this is just a single, simple example of, uh, of what you can do. Um, so the, the, the rules are pretty simple, uh, but yet it's so complicated. Uh, why it's complicated? Because it's not easy to find out what are the, those five items that should go on the list. And uh, it's also not easy to um, find uh, the correct size of those things so that at the end of the day, you can have that check, that green check on the item, and you can feel that sense of accomplishment, which is the, the main engine, the main uh, fuel that keeps you working then on the other items for this, this day, for today, and for the next day. Um, for, maybe I didn't mention it, but uh, at the end of the day, you're supposed to spend another five minutes thinking about what you want to do, uh, what are the five most important things to do tomorrow. Um, I didn't mention it, it was in the, in the story. Um, 
in the initial story. Um, what is revolutionary, if you want, is that uh, is missing a to-do list, a huge to-do list. Uh, sometimes they becomes unmanageable, um, too long. Uh, it requires too much time to prioritize the item on the list because everything is that in, in that list. So I don't know if you ever experienced that. Um, and why it works? Because the brain is already your uh, automatically filtering to the list. So you are perfectly able to forget what is not important to do. And hopefully you will be ab able to remember what is important to do today and tomorrow. So that should be easy for your brain to remember. And as, uh, at the same time, it should be easy for your brain to forget what is not important for the future. Um, that's all. Any questions? I have two minutes. I have a couple of minutes. I have one there. Oh. Well, it's the same. Go ahead. Um, you went through it starting from like a big picture set of goals, right? You started with the year and worked back up. Was that part of the technique or was it like just accidental? Uh, well, that is, is an expansion of the technique. Can you repeat so, the question, please? Oh, yes. Um, he asked if this is, um, is it, if this going top down from the year down to, the to, uh, to today is part of the technique. Uh, it's not part of the original story, which is a, a true story. Uh, but it's part of the extensions that uh, has been added later by uh, the ideas of Cameron Herald. So yes, it's part of the, the technique. Yeah. Um, do you recommend those who have a separate list for work and for like, <laughs> life? I think it's okay. Um, I I tend to do, to make to do uh, to put everything in the same thing because uh, what I need to do today maybe it's part personal and part work. Yeah, but it could be that the work would like push out the personal space. <laughs> that is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. How long have you been doing it? Um, not that long. Um, three months. So it's not that long, but I come from, um, and I'm still using it, other techniques like the Commodore technique. So I'm quite used to learn these kind of improvement techniques and try to uh, integrate them with my current workflow and maybe personalize them a little bit. So no, but it's not that long, it's three months. And I'm struggling with it. It's, uh, it's difficult, as I said. But you're quick. Yeah, it's quite new. Uh, there's, uh, well, uh, uh, there are really a few blog posts about it. Um, that's it. Um, there's uh, a product I'm developing. Um, it's called teamlead.com, and that is implementing this technique. That is the other thing. Um, but other than that, nothing else. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's against it because getting things done will try to uh, push all your tasks, everything that comes into your mind in, into the inventory list and then try to prioritize them recursively. So it's quite, quite the opposite, I would say. I'm thinking of a different thing. But well, we, we can talk it, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>